In this video, I'm gonna to reveal to you which state is in the biggest housing bubble in America. Quite simply, home prices in this state have gotten so out of control, so ridiculous, that they're almost guaranteed to come down. I think potentially 20, 30, even 40% price declines in certain cities across the state. And that means if you're a particular home buyer or real estate investor in this area, you better watch out, you better be careful because there is massive trouble ahead. Now, what I'm also gonna do in this video is share with you the underlying data that I'm using to predict where housing bubbles are occurring in America. So you can assess whether your city or your state is in a bubble and how much prices could be declining. So this is going to be a great video for you to watch if you're uh, an upcoming home buyer or real estate investor trying to figure out whether now is the right time to buy or wait, when you should get in the market. This video is going to give you the data and the tools so you can make a better, more informed decision. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So the first place we're going to start, as always, is with a graph. And to really understand which markets in America are in the biggest bubble today, we need to actually go back to the last housing bubble, which peaked in 06, 07, and understand which markets in the last housing bubble had the biggest crash. And that's what we're looking at on this graph. And I want you to pay attention to the color coding. The darker the red uh, the market is, for instance, Las Vegas, Nevada, the more the home price decline was during the last housing crash from 2007 to 2012. So we can see Las Vegas dark red dot had a 64% decline in home prices during the last crash. Phoenix had a 53% decline. Naples, Florida, 48%. Cape Coral, 57%. Riverside, California, 52%. And basically, all of these markets, these red dots in the top right quadrant of this graph got absolutely hammered in the last housing crash. 40, 50, 60% declines. Owners in these markets lost everything. Everyone was underwater. Lots of foreclosures. It was an absolute bloodbath. Now, the central question I think a lot of you are wondering is like, what explained this crash in these markets? Were there particular data points that would have allowed you to predict if these markets were going to have a crash and how big the crash would have been? And the answer is yes. And we're looking at these data points on this graph. On the x-axis, we're taking a look at a metric I call value to earnings ratio, which measures the affordability of the local housing market. It takes the typical home price and divides it by the average annual wage of the typical worker. And the higher the value to earnings ratio is, the more expensive the market is, the more locals are priced down. So you could see back in 2007, the higher the VE ratio was in certain markets, the more red the dots were. But that's not the only thing that mattered. Additionally, the amount of new building, the amount of new homes being built in these markets also mattered, which is what we're tracking on the y-axis, a metric called permit percentage. And so the more new building was occurring in the years before the housing crash, the more that these markets suffered in terms of price declines during the crash. And so this is what I want you to think of. Last time around in 07, it was the markets with a high VE ratio, aka very expensive, with a high permit percentage, aka lots of new building that had 40, 50, 60% price declines. And it's so important to establish this fundamental model of understanding the risk factors of buying into the US housing market in 2021, because I think we're in the biggest housing bubble, bubble America has ever seen. Home prices relative to inflation are at the highest levels of all time right now, entering the fall of 2021. Year over year price appreciation is at an all time high, 18, 19% per year. That's never been experienced before. And all of this is happening in the backdrop of a global pandemic and recession where America is down 5 million jobs from its pre-pandemic levels it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we're in a massive housing bubble. So with that backdrop, if you're a home buyer or real estate investor, you should be conscious of the risk factors that are present in the markets you're buying in. If you're in a place with a high value to earnings ratio, meaning that prices are high relative to local wages, that's a risk factor that could mean big price declines over the next couple of years. Additionally, if you're in a market with a high level of new building, lots of new homes and apartments getting built, a high permit percentage, which takes the number of permits and divides it by the number of jobs in the local economy, you are also at risk. And so if you are someone who's a home buyer, real estate investor, who still wants to participate in this market, even though we're in a big bubble, these are metrics that you really need to understand for your city. Because the markets with the high VE ratios and the high permit percentages, I think they have the biggest downside here in 2021, just like they did back in 06, 07. 
Now, what we're looking at on this map are all of the large metro areas in America. There's hundreds across the US, all these different micro housing markets across the country. And what I'm gonna do for you guys is narrow down this list of all of the markets in America to the ones that are in the biggest bubbles. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're gonna do that using those two data points we just talked about, value to earnings ratio and permit percentage. We're gonna try to find the markets that are the most expensive and with the most new building. This is gonna key us in to which state is in the biggest housing bubble. And the first place we're gonna start is by using value to earnings ratio. So basically, we're gonna eliminate any market in America with a VE ratio below 8X, meaning that home prices are less than eight times annual wages. We're gonna eliminate these markets because they're deemed as more affordable and less likely to be in a big bubble here in 2021. And these remaining markets on the map, they are more likely to be in a bubble because these are the ones where home prices are super expensive compared to what locals earn. And you can see that we have a couple Northeastern markets here. New York is pretty expensive with a VE ratio of 8.9. Boston is expensive, VE ratio of 8.5. Portland, Maine, VE ratio of 8.2. Um, but outside of these kind of Northeastern markets, it's really the West Coast in America that's the expensive area for housing. Pretty much everywhere from Colorado westward has really expensive homes relative to local wages. And just by looking at this metric on its own, I think we can see that it's gonna be the Western half of the US that basically leads this housing crash. It's gonna have the biggest decline in home prices going forward because quite simply, locals are priced out of the market in these areas. If you guys are enjoying this content and you wanna see more of it going forward, just make sure to hit that like button. When you do that, it gets these videos a bit more exposure on YouTube, which in turn allows me to produce more of these videos, more of this content going forward. So again, if you wanna see more of this, hit that like button. Additionally, make sure to leave a comment. Let me know what you're seeing in your housing market. If you're a buyer, investor, seller, renter, what are you seeing on the ground? When you guys comment, it makes these videos better. All right, let's get back to it. Now, we also need to consider the levels of new building. Because for instance, in a place like California, which has super high VE ratios, one of the reasons that California is so expensive is because they have a perpetual housing shortage. They don't build enough new homes. And we're not really looking for the type of market that doesn't build enough new homes because the bubble market is gonna be one that actually builds a lot of new homes. So the second filter we're gonna apply here is the permit percentage over the last 12 months. And we're gonna want a minimum permit percentage of 1.5%. And once again, what permit percentage is taking is we're taking the permits pulled for new homes and apartments over the previous 12 months and we're dividing it by the total number of jobs in the economy. So for instance, Austin, Texas has a permit percentage of 4.2% which is one of the highest in America. So if you take the total job count, multiply it by 0 0.042, that's how many permits were pulled in Austin. And basically what's going on now with all these markets left on the graph is that they are fitting this criteria of very expensive and lots of new home building. That's a risky combination. That's exactly the combination we saw in the first graph that doomed so many of those markets in the last housing crash that led to 40, 50, even 60% declines was when we were expensive and when we had lots of new building. So in addition to Austin, if we zoom in, we can see that basically most of the mountain region of the US from Colorado, markets like Greeley and Denver and Colorado Springs have uh, this criteria that could mean a big housing crash coming forward. If we zoom to the Pacific Northwest, places like Bellingham, Washington, Bend, Oregon, uh, they have the criteria of being expensive, lots of new building. Reno, Nevada fits this criteria as well, as does Boise, Idaho. I'm sure if you guys watch my channel, you know I think Boise is in a big bubble. But really what I'm gonna focus on today is Utah. That's right, Utah, everyone, because Utah, in my opinion, of any state, is in the biggest housing bubble in America, going from north to south. Ogden, Utah, value to earnings ratio of 9.5, permit percentage of 2.1, both extremely elevated. Salt Lake City, value to earnings ratio of 9.2, permit percentage of 1.6, extremely elevated. Provo, Utah, oh boy, 11.1 value to earnings ratio, 3.7% permit percentage. Provo might be, as far as a city goes, in the biggest bubble of any city or metro area in the US. And if we go all the way down south to St. George, Utah, we see a similar situation. 12.5X value to earnings ratio, 3.6 permit percentage. So of all the states in America, Utah is the one 
that fits the criteria of being in the biggest housing bubble. And again, remember, here's what we're analyzing. We're analyzing markets where prices all of a sudden are very high relative to what locals earn. And in Utah right now, the local home buyers are absolutely priced out right now. And prices will need to come down for them to be able to afford uh, something in the local housing market. Then the other side of the equation here is building. Utah builds tons of new homes and apartments. And this is really key because you hear a lot of people talking about the supposed massive housing shortage in America that we're somehow short by four to five million homes in the US being built over the last 10 to 15 years. And I think that could be true in certain parts of the country, like in California, they really struggle to build new homes, but that is not the case in Utah. Places like Ogden and Salt Lake and Provo and St. George, they pound out new homes and new apartments. They are building as much as they ever have right now. So there is no fundamental structural housing shortage going on in a place like Utah. And this is super concerning. I think a metro like Provo is going to be closer to that 40% price decline range as is potentially St. George. Somewhere like Salt Lake City might be more of a 20 to 25% price decline. But I really think all across the state, you're going to see big turbulence, big pain in Utah's housing market over the next two to three years. Now, it's at this point that I actually wanna draw a bit of a caveat here between the short term, which is maybe two to three years, and the long term, which is say five to 10 years or longer. And you should really be asking yourself as a home buyer or a real estate investor, what is your investment timeline? Is it short term or is it long term? If it's short term, that probably means you should not be buying in Utah right now. Like if you're a three year hold type of person who's speculating and investing, boy, you could run into some big problems buying into Utah. Or if you're someone who's kind of rushing into the housing market to buy a home for yourself and feeling a lot of FOMO and buying a house you don't really like, thinking that, oh, I can just uh, sell it and upgrade in two to three years, Utah could be very problematic for you. However, if you're a long-term investor, someone who has a 10 plus year investment horizon, someone who's buying a home that you know you're gonna be living in for the next decade plus, or buying an investment property that you know you're gonna be holding for the next decade plus, Utah could still be a good place to invest and here's why. Utah actually has some of the best underlying demographics of any state in America. And actually, I think the best long-term growth perspective for its local population and economy. Quite simply, there's no other state that can match Utah in terms of its future levels of population growth. And that, of course, is gonna be very good for the long-term health of the housing market. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And so we're taking a look at a map of the 48 continental US states, and we're analyzing them by a certain demographic variable where the redder the state looks, the better it performs in this variable, and the bluer the state looks, the worse it performs. And you can see off the bat, Utah is dark red. There is no other state that comes close to comparing in terms of this demographic performance, whereas places like Florida are dark blue, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Maine are dark blue. And what is this variable we're considering? Well, it's uh, something I call birth, to death ratio. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that in 2020 in Utah, there was 95,000 births compared to only 38,000 deaths. So there was 2.5 times as many births as deaths in Utah in 2020. And this is by far the highest level in America, AKA more births than deaths. You can see Texas is number two and Texas is only at 1.7. So Utah is in a stratosphere unto itself in terms of procreation and repopulating uh, you know, its state and new births as well as avoiding new deaths. Now a place like Florida is kind of the, on the other end of the spectrum. Florida is at 0 0.95 uh, birth to death ratio, which means there's actually more deaths than births in Florida in a given year. You can see in 2020, Florida had 461,000 births compared to 440,000 deaths. If we go to a place like Maine, Maine's even more extreme. Maine has a birth to death ratio of 0 0.78, only 24,000 births compared to 31,000 deaths. And basically all of these states that are around one to one or below one to one, that means they're below replacement level. So more people are dying in the blue states and being born. That's a bad, bad thing for the future of their local housing markets. Whereas in these states in red or in more gray colors like California, Colorado, Nebraska, San Diego, Idaho, 
they have a lot of people being born for how many people dying that's going to be a good thing for the long-term health but particularly in utah where no other state is even close now i suspect you guys might have a couple questions based on that graph the first of which might be what explains these tremendous differences in terms of births and deaths across america and the simple answer is age a state like utah is the youngest state in america median age of 31 compared to the U.S. median age of 38 in a state like Florida, which has a median age of 42. The lower median age in Utah means that it has a higher population in that 20 to 40 year old range that would be uh, the population that has children and produces births. And it also has a lower population in that 70 plus range that's a population that would die. And that means that Utah's organic population growth is gonna be the best in America going forward over the next several decades. And Utah quite simply doesn't even need inward migration. It can rely simply on the organic growth it's experiencing within its state to propel its economy and its housing market forward. Now, the second point you might be wondering, like how exactly do births and deaths affect the local economy and housing market? Well, the first thing you need to think of is that a birth is a form of economic stimulus while a, a death is a form of economic contraction. When a baby is born, all of a sudden the parents go from saving money to all of a sudden spending twenty to thirty thousand dollars on that baby into the local economy in the first year it's born. You know, new clothes, food, maybe a bigger car. All of a sudden the baby is born, the parents go from saving money to spending money. Alternatively, when someone dies, uh, that's one less person that's uh, spending money on clothes, on food, on consuming things in the local economy. So that's economic contraction. So if you have a good birth to death ratio, that's going to be great for your overall economy. But of course, in the long run, it's also going to be good for your housing market. Because those babies that are born today or the babies that were born 10 years ago, they're going to be demanding housing units into the future. And this is why I actually love Utah's housing market in the long term perspective, 10 plus years, because all of these babies being born today, that's stimulating the local economy. And these babies are going to start demanding housing units down the line. And that means that Utah has really good fundamentals for its long term housing market, whereas a lot of those states in blue on the map that are in organic population decline, whether it be Florida, Pennsylvania, Maine, Vermont, Alabama, South Carolina, they're going to have some issues down the line um, in their in their housing markets as more and more people die as baby boomers begin to age really into 75, 80 years old and we're not replenishing the population, that's gonna create problems in a lot of housing markets. Utah is not gonna have those same problems. But on the other hand, I still believe Utah is in the biggest short-term housing bubble in America. When you look at the fundamentals on things like home prices relative to wages, when you look at how many new homes and apartments are being built, it all says that over the next two to three years, there will be big pain in Utah's housing market. As I said, potentially 20 to 40% declines, depending on where you go within the state. And the thing you need to ask yourself is, am I a short-term or a long-term buyer? Short-term buyers could really, I think, get hurt buying into Utah's housing market right now. Long-term buyers who have the patience and the finances to afford a little bit of uh, volatility and turbulence and a dip, they might still want to buy today because the underlying demographics of the state are really, really strong. And at some point, they're going to begin to run out of land to develop. After all, Utah geographically has a lot of supply constraints, mountains, lakes, that eventually they're going to run out of space to build. And at that point, we could actually see Utah legitimately turn into maybe a California type of situation where the home prices just say, perpetually high. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this video. Metrics like value to earnings ratio and permit percentage are so key for you to understand where your housing market's at in 2021. Does your market have all of a sudden a big spike in prices relative to how much people are making? Is your housing market building a lot? If so, maybe we stay away. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if your housing market's affordable and we're not building a lot, then maybe it's a safe place to buy. And I'm gonna cover more of those markets in future videos, the markets that offer maybe the best value perspective for buyers. So if you wanna track that data going forward, see those videos, make sure you're a subscriber, number one. I come out with three of these data-driven videos per week. If you're a subscriber who turns on notifications, uh, the bell down below, you're not gonna miss a video. Additionally, you're gonna to wanna to think about becoming a ReVenture channel sponsor member. The cost is $5 a month and you get some really cool perks. There's an exclusive members-only community board where I post data and graphs and polls that I don't post anywhere else 
Members actually have a big impact on which markets I cover. They're actually the ones that said, Utah is the next market I should cover in a deep dive. That's why I did this video. Additionally, members also get access to an exclusive monthly newsletter, which you can now see on the screen. This is a monthly newsletter I come out with outlining all of the data across the US housing market each month, things like jobs, prices, wages, permits, and what it means for the future of the housing market. If you want access to this newsletter, as well as an associated exclusive video each month that comes out with the newsletter, you want to become a member. So hit the join button below. There's also a link in the description. Before we end, I also want to give a shout out to two people, Abdul Latif and Eric, who both correctly guessed on the community board yesterday that the mystery map was birth to death ratio. So gold star for both Abdul Latif and Eric. Make sure to give them a congratulations. All right, everyone. Until next time, this is Nick from Reventure Consulting signing off. Oh.